Okay, uh, just a little bit about my myself. I'm currently a professor, a student distinguished professor at the University of Buffalo. And so the flagship university of the State University of New York. Uh, before then, I was a professor at uh, Texas A&M and Catholic University before then. And then I worked at NASA Goddard, where I worked on a number of uh, spacecraft missions. So first of all, thank you for having me today. Uh, it's also great to hear about all the wonderful things your society is doing. Uh, I didn't know any of those things, so very glad to see that. So today, I'm going to talk about space debris. It's just floating space junk, so why, why do we care? First, I want to define what, what exactly is uh, space debris. It's anything that isn't useful anymore. So like a spent rocket stage, a defunct or unknown satellites, even fragments from collisions, for example, paint flank is considered to be a piece of space debris. Some of early famous debris, uh, Ed White, when he walked out, there was a glove that came out at the same time he did. It ended up coming back in and uh, burned up on, on re-entry. It's interesting that this long lost third stage of Apollo 12, this was discovered about 20 years ago and there was an astronomer that um, was looking at an object and thought it was a, a new asteroid or something. And uh, there was a spectral analysis done on it and realized that it was paint. And that's how they identified it was Apollo 12. So it was lost for all those years. It's the other thing about space objects. Sometimes we lose them for a very long time. Here's an interesting one, a tool bag that you can see this astronaut, she's trying to reach for it as it's going away from her. This is something we actually track. You can see it go across the night sky. We well, see that little video there, but there it goes. Uh, so that's something we actually track. Some other interesting debris, if you want to be buried in space, you can certainly do that now. Uh, Gene Roddenberry, among other individuals, have been buried in space. In 1963, the US created an artificial ionosphere consisting of 480 million tiny copper needles. Uh, some of them are still up there as well, too. A publicity stunt, golf ball was driven by a Russian cosmos not in 2006, it did burn up in, in the atmosphere. In the old days of the space station, in the space shuttle, the urine was dumped overboard and that immediately froze into tiny crystals. Uh, now it's recycled and turned into water. Even a lost spatula, I can't, I don't even know why. How do you lose a spatula in space, but a spatula, okay. <laughs> and I just talked about the camera. Um, at the end of 2011, or sorry, the end of the day, on March 8th, 2011, you can see the strange curly Q comet appeared in the twilight sky. You can see this with your naked eye. Um, usually ask the people in the audience to guess what that is, but I'll tell you what it is. Um, it's actually the urine. And it got so bright that you can see it from the night sky. Uh, it's kind of a cool looking object. It's uh, considered debris. And here's a company for you. I'm not advocating for this company, it's one of them, but that's a one company you can contact if you want to be buried in space. So why do we care about space debris? I mean, it's just floating space junk, as I just mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. So to, to do that, I have to give, I have to, sorry, I have to give a little bit of math, but once you see this math, I'm sure everybody's gonna get the answer. Okay, here we go. All right, everybody got the answer? No, <laughs> okay, so now obviously I'm not gonna go through this math, but this is, a, this is math that most of this math, seniors in our aerospace and mostly every aerospace program in the country uh, will be going through. I'm gonna go simpler than that. Let's go back to high, high school level math. Uh, so as we all know, Galileo, Galileo dropped two balls of different masses from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and he demonstrated that the time of descent was independent of mass. He realized that a falling body picked up speed at a constant rate. We call that acceleration, which means addition of speed in Italian. He also made the Crusoe observation that air resistance and buoyancy can be neglected. All bodies fall at the same acceleration. So for example, if you drop a cannonball off a cliff, it will fall about 16 feet in the first second. The formula is one half g, g squared, or g is 32.2 feet per second squared. Here's where things get interesting. It's really an amazing discovery is if you fire an object exactly at the same speed, it will still fall 16 feet in one second, no matter how you fall, drop it. So for example, here's a plane that's shooting a bullet. If the bullet is dropped and shot, another one is shot, the bullet's gonna fall 16 feet in one second. That was Newton that came up with that. And I love this video. You can see a feather and a ball dropping at the same rate in a vacuum, just to do that Galileo is correct. Okay, so Newton took this further. Uh, when I get, I talk a lot to uh, K through 12 kids and I always tell them that uh, it wasn't the apple that uh, helped them discover gravity was actually this exact problem. 
what he did was, and this is an actual diagram from the 1728 book. What he did is imagine a cannon on top of a very high mountain and he shot a cannonball at some velocity and it hit at point B over here. And he shot a little faster, hit at point E and another faster one hit down here to F. And he asked himself an interesting question. At what velocity do I have to file this projectile so it never hits the ground? And the answer to that is very fast. It's, uh, we'll get to that in a second. But there's basically three things that can happen here. The first is it falls to the ground. The second is it achieves orbit. And the last one is it goes away and it can go off to the moon and Mars. So let's do some very simple math to find out what that velocity is. So I'm going to do an exaggerated diagram. It goes to simple Pythagorean theorem here. Um, so in, as you said, in one second, it goes down 16 feet. And we want to determine what this V is. So we plug in the radius of the Earth at about 21 million feet. And we calculate the velocity in one second, it's 26,000 feet. And this calculation down here is just to calculate that in one second, we convert that at miles per hour. It's about 17,000, 1,700, about 17,500 miles per hour. Anything slower than that, the Earth's gravity is going to pull it back in. So that's why you can't just get into an airplane and go off into space. You need to achieve that velocity. That's why we need big rockets. So I actually, I actually misled you with the title. I said that it's just floating space junk. That's not how you should think of it. When you see astronauts floating in space, quote unquote, they're not floating. They're actually falling at 17,500 miles per hour, but they're never hitting the ground. That's the way you really should think of them. And I should also know 25,000 miles per hour is the escape velocity that we need to go to travel to Mars. Some interesting things that uh, the orbital altitude is related to how fast the object is going around. Uh, Kepler gave us the formula and Newton updated it. In low Earth orbit, this is where the space station flies. It takes about 90 minutes to go around the Earth. An interesting orbit that was rediscovered by Arthur C. Clarke is geostationary orbit, which is about 22,000 miles up. That has the same orbital period as the Earth. That is 24 hours. So what does that mean? From us, it looks like the satellite's standing still. So that's where our direct TV and all that stuff, that's why you could point your antenna dish to that same point in the sky. That's the good news. The bad news is it's really up there, 22,000 miles away. So it takes a lot to get up there and a lot of our communication satellites. Uh, this, the earlier series of this, a geostation operational environmental satellite. This was a satellite that I worked on while I was at NASA. And some amazing imaging. Um, the accuracy of this is they wanted four kilometers in the ground. And to do that, it's 12 microradians. Um, I believe that's being able to read a 2020 from three football fields away. So that's just some incredible things. And it's done some great, uh, mostly every all the weather images you see come from there. You can see a nice hurricane here. Actually, uh, at the Goddard Auditorium, they had images from two goes, one sitting in the East Coast and one on the West, and did the first stereo imaging of a hurricane. And we all got 3D glasses to see that. So that geo orbit is also starting to get a little crowded. Okay, so now we know stuff in orbit is traveling pretty fast. Um, so what? It's a big deal. Well, there's different kinds of orbits. I just described a few of them here. There's uh, one that goes around the equator, for example. And by the way, geostationary, that's where they that's where they all fly around the equator. You can also have stuff that goes around the poles. Uh, example of why polar orbits useful, the first time they imaged Mars, they flew around the poles and took a swath image every time they went. It was a brilliant design. The next time they went around, that swath that came with the next time was right next to the previous swath. And that's how they're aim able to image all of Mars. So there's various reasons why we put things in different orbits. Uh, Sirius XM has some in interesting orbit associated with that. What it does allow is there's three satellites, but these orbits are designed such that at least one satellite would be over the US at one time. So at all times, sorry. So what that means, um, that means that uh, we we're not gonna lose any of our satellite uh, in our Sirius XM, it's kind of cool. All right, so here's an analogy. So again, stuff is going pretty fast, but if they're in the same orbit, like use a car lane analogy, and you're right next to each other, or right behind each other, not a problem. But let's say I've got one in the equator and one that goes around the pole. And right now I'm in the T-bone intersection case, and that can lead to a very violent collision. So imagine what a little marble can do to a satellite if it's colliding at 17,700 miles per hour. A lot of momentum. And there's many opportunities for a collision. This is a simulation I did uh, where two objects are going to collide here in the equator. I'm going to come back here. 
make 45 degree and polar orbits at dead end, right? They're going to collide. All right, so I can't talk about the good, bad, and the ugly. There is no good, so I have to talk about the not so bad, the bad, and the ugly. And not so bad impacts from debris that causes minor issues. Every time the space shuttle came down, they had to replace the windows. And here's a the window just pitted by small little pieces of micro, micro meteorites or even um, pieces of debris. Here's a piece of debris that went through the dish of Hubble. Um, didn't cause anything major, um, but still went through it. Um, here's a panel that came down from Hubble, and every one of those arrows is pointing to a piece of debris that hit it. Uh, again, it didn't go through the satellite to cause any problems, but you can see the amount of stuff that hits it. The rise of mega constellations, uh, this is starting to become a problem. There's good and bad news. Obviously, having internet for everybody is very good news. Um, but we're looking at a lot, 12,000 satellites that are eventually going to be up there with uh, SpaceX, Starlink, and also Amazon's Cooper, and, and there's also another satellites as well, as well too. Before these mega constellations, uh, the biggest one we really had was the Iridium communication satellites, which just totaled 70. Now we're going from 70 to thousands of objects. Um, we're still, we just don't know the impact quite yet of what's going on. Some of the unforeseen stuff that's already been happening um, for astronomers, it's causing light pollution. And this is a simulation. If all of them are up there, it's basically going to be polluting all the time. So just don't know how to handle this right now. Um, so like I said, there's good and, some good and bad news there, unfortunately. They're really bad. Um, now, we, I'll talk about tracking in a second. But in 2009, two big satellites, Russian Cosmos, which is the defunct weather satellite, and U.S. uranium satellite uh, collided and resulted in about 500 pieces of debris. This sent up a huge message up to us that said, uh, we can't track this stuff as well as we thought. And I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Uh, there's debris taking out satellites, other bad things. Uh, China in 2007 launched an anti-satellite. It's just a missile, missile that hit one of their own satellites just to prove that they could do it. And that resulted about 2,500 pieces of debris. And this is a simulation of the initial impact of that debris field. And the space station does go through that. And this is a more <laughs> advanced view of it uh, time-wise. And you can see that debris field just all over the Earth. The first acknowledged maneuver was done in 2007. Uh, the NASA's terror satellite had a 7% chance of being struck. And just to give you an idea why 7% is huge, uh, we will do a maneuver if the chance is bigger than one in 10,000. So there's a lot of math that goes behind computing that probability of collision, but uh, we can do it. Um, and those two satellites, by the way, the Iridium Cosmos they collided did not meet that threshold of one in 10,000. It just happened to win what's called a bad lottery that day. Okay, and that's the space station where that flies compared to the debris field. You can see it does pass through it. So how long is that stuff going to stay up there? Well, we really don't know. There's actually air molecules in low Earth orbit. Not enough to breathe, obviously, but enough to cause drag. Just like if you take your, uh, put your hand out of your car and you can feel a drag from the air. Uh, analytical graph is a great company. I know a lot of people there. They did a study, but the basic, basic, even if you take the most conservative model, you're going to have 79% of that Chinese data is still going to be there 100 years from now. So now you start to see the problem here. A lot of that stuff will be there for a very long time. Uh, India also did this, but uh, much more con control maneuver. They did it only hit about 50 pieces of debris. Just want to okay. show as a satellite to be engaged. The ground guidance system computed the exact launch time, and the missile was launched at 11:09 hours on 27th March 2019. The booster stages had taken the missile to the required heights and velocities before the kill vehicle was released. The heat shield was ejected subsequently, and the IIR seeker locked onto the target at the expected range. The terminal guidance executed the small and precise corrections to the path of the kill vehicle, and the target was hit at the intended aim point within 10 centimeter accuracy. The intercept occurred at 283 kilometer height in a hit to kill mode. The radars and electro-optical systems captured the interception and the onboard IIR seeker's last image also confirmed the same. So that's kind of a neat video to show um, 
from an engineering point, that's pretty impressive, I got to tell you. But um, I'll, I'll get to the politics about this later on. Uh, Russia also did this uh, just about a year ago. And uh, really, I don't know the extent of that, but right now, tracking about 1,500 pieces of debris. Okay, so we know we can do this now. I don't know why we, I don't know why countries are doing this, just causing more debris. And this is before and after an impact. And America's another company I know extremely well. They've got telescopes and you can see, you can see what the impact did there. All right, the ugly. Uh, no human has been hurt in space. Well, technically not. The Columbia tile was really considered a piece of space debris. The danger is real. Uh, in 2011, astronauts were forced to go into the escape hatches when debris came over at a thousand feet. The space station has done over 25 maneuvers since 1999. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is actually. It doesn't take much for a catastrophic destruction of the space station. Only a whole 0.4 inches radius will um, pretty much blow up the whole space station. Uh, and about 20 years ago, I, we had worked um, with NASA Johnson to develop a method to determine leaks in the space station. All right, so this has just been updated from August of this year. It talks about how many launches we've had, over 6,000, number of satellites that have been placed, about 14,000 or so, 13,500. Number still functioning, uh, still got 6,000, and that's growing again with the mega constellations. The number of objects that we track is about 31,000 objects that we currently track. I want to talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> what we can currently, currently track is about anything bigger than a softball size, about four inches in diameter. And they, um, to get in the catalog, you have to know the origin, there's a whole story behind that. And this is just a, a chart, a classic chart showing uh, the amount of objects out there. But you can see this big spike in, in 2007. That's when the Chinese did their ASAT launch um, and caused 2,500 pieces of debris. And I can see that really big growth. And if we go into uh, further on, you're going to see that the launch of those mega constellations is going to grow it even further. So, yeah. Um, this is a classic diagram that you see. Um, I don't like it because this makes it worse than it makes it look worse than it really is because every one of those objects is like the size of Maine. But anyways, that's why it's like this. So you can see the low Earth orbit there and you see that geo belt as well too. All right, uh, Kessler, Dono Kessler, uh, 1978. Um, I had talked to him through email a few times, a really nice man, but he had predicted what is now known as Kessler syndrome. And the idea is that objects will be colliding with each other and those objects will be colliding with other objects. And we get to a tipping point where we're gonna have so many objects that we can't uh, do anything about it, about it. Meaning that you, you gotta think that when you when somebody launches a satellite, you gotta take insurance out, just like you would your car insurance. Uh, but if you have the chance of, of colliding, it's gonna be so great, they're not gonna insure you. Um, and that's when we're reaching Kessel syndrome. I think we're going to be there in 50 years. If we don't do anything now. The other thing is uh, we have to track these objects. We need sensors on the ground and in space. And there's just not that many dedicated ones. You can see a big empty space over uh, Russia here and everything like that. Uh, so it, what happens here is that we have to use models to predict where they're going to be. And they're exactly the same equations that Newton came up with, by the way. So what we do is when we get an observation, then we can get a better idea where they are, but when we don't see them, which could be up to three months or even longer years, like the Apollo 12, we have to use theoretical models to kind of predict where they're gonna go. And we don't want this happening, right? You don't want your object to go through your tracking station, but um, there are some quote unquote new sensors. One of them is already 10 years old, but uh, they're putting object sensors in space too to track debris. Um, Another one, space surveillance telescope is going to get us even dimmer objects. Um, so that's going to be good. So one thing that the Air Force talks a lot about is persistent surveillance. Can we get to it? There's a lot of defense uh, stuff that goes on too that I can't talk about, unfortunately. But um, persistent surveillance is the idea that let's build enough sensors so we can see these objects 24 hours a day. And that sounds like good news. Um, so it's funny when I, I give talks to freshmen and I always say when an engineer tells you a piece of good news, the first thing you should ask is what's the bad news? Because I've never seen good news be associated without some kind of bad news. So what can be possibly bad about tracking more objects? Well, you're tracking more objects and you got you got to associate objects. So you can't you can't see my hand, but let's say if you put your hand out, you get your thumb to your pinky and then you label that one through five and then you do another scan Let's say a second later, you see five objects. You got to associate your thumb to your thumb. Um, 
if you've got objects in a telescope that are crossing each other because they're at different altitudes, that's going to be very difficult to associate. Now, it even gets worse because the next time you may not see five objects, you may only see four. So what, what happens there? Or you see six, a new one that comes in. So as we start to track more objects, that's going to become the so-called data association problem is going to be um, more interesting. Our center is already looking at this problem, looking ahead to someday when we get there, how are we going to overcome this? We, there's no perfect data association. Uh, we're always going to misassociate at some point. So this is something that we have to look at. So um, what are the things that causes our models to be not as accurate as we want? Um, and actually, Newton's equations for orbital are the most accurate models out there we have for any kind of uh, system that I've ever seen in my life, but it's still not good enough, unfortunately. So it's basically two things, uh, drag and lower orbit is the, the main thing that um, we're looking at, but we just don't know the air density really well. NSF has spent millions of dollars trying to model that, and it's just, we don't know it well enough. We know it obviously well enough to be able to bring objects down to the ground and have our astronauts land and everything like that, but we don't know, know it accurate enough to say where these objects are gonna be going when, um, when we lose track of them. In the higher Earth orbit, you got something called solar emission pressure. It's not really solar wind, but if you want to think of it that way, that's fine. Uh, that's directly related to the solar flux, so we just don't know that well either enough. Obviously, the, the, the shape matters, right? So if you have a flat plate going in a, a drag profile, it's going to have a lot more drag than a, a sphere. Um, so we want to know the shape of these objects. And unfortunately, right now, everything is modeled. Even to this day, this is done since the 1960s, we model every object up there as a cannonball, which is not correct. So we want to try to get shapes. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about my research here. Uh, so you can see here a, an image of the space shuttle. But at high Earth orbit, we don't get that. You just get, see how it's dimming and getting brighter. So only get what's called the magnitude over time. And my Earth first program manager called me and said, hey, just from that information, you think you can estimate this shape. And I said, oh, I got this crazy idea. And it turned out uh, it works to a pretty good degree. We've done a lot of experimental verifications. So we're trying to characterize that debris because once we get better models of it, in terms of its shape and other properties like materials, we can get better predictions of where it's gonna go and get better idea of what that probably is collision. So actually building a few satellites for the uh, Air Force. One of them, we're having our Air Force is coming in for a review in a couple of weeks here. Uh, one of them is called uh, GLaDOS. And what this is basically going to do is search the <laughs> geo belt to try to get what's called a glint, essentially a mirror-like reflection, because that's really rich data that we want to get. Um, and the only time we can get that from the ground is about two weeks at the fall and spring equinox is that really rich data we want. Um, but this satellite is going to extend that glint season, that's what the Air Force calls it, from uh, a few weeks to several months. So they're very interested in this. So I kind of already talked about this, that everything is modeled as a cannonball, but in reality, it's not. And we're trying to go from the top to the bottom here to get better models and hopefully better predict where these objects are going to go. So really weird objects, uh, hammer objects, higher to imagine. You think of it, uh, a big piece of tinfoil uh, up in space. And it gets some really weird effects. You see orbits all over the place. These objects are extremely difficult to track. Uh, they cause us a lot of headaches. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that, but um, all right. So now we know even a small piece of debris can be dangerous. Let's talk about mitigation strategies. What are ways to overcome this stuff? Um, no matter what you hear, nobody has any viable cost-effective solution. There are no shortages of ideas. We have our own too. Um, we all agree that something needs to be done, especially in low Earth orbit. Like I said, I, I, I tell these uh, K through 12 students that if our generation isn't going to solve it, and I don't think we are, uh, your generation is for sure going to have to solve it. It's basically characterized in four approaches. Shielding, obviously, to protect objects. Uh, reduce the amount, if you can, and we'll talk more about that. It's more political. Self-removal uh, applies mostly to active satellites. Uh, in high Earth orbiting satellites, uh, geo, they cannot come down. They go into what's called graveyard orbits, like 500 kilometers away. And then external removal. And I'll talk about all the issues with that. Okay, shielding, actually, in 1947, before even 1957 was the dawn of the space age. So Fred Whipple, I'm sure he was not thinking about this particular problem, but um, he invented what's now known as the Whipple shield. It can withstand small debris hits, um, velocities between two and 11 miles per second. It does not, it still allows the object to go and hit the main hull. 
um, but it's basically it disintegrates it when it goes through the shield so it doesn't go through the hull. And right? so it, acts, it shocks the object as it goes in. The space station has over 100 Whipple shields to protect us. It's actually pretty well protected from very small objects. Uh, ATK wanted to take this to another level and make a huge Whipple shield in space. We cannot do this. Uh, this without controlling the structure, even build the structures, we don't have the technology to do this in space, but say we did that to control the structure. I did my dissertation on by large, vibration control of large flexible structures, which is exactly what this is. We just do not have the uh, capability to be able to control something like this. So it's a nice idea, but, and then you got another big object there in space, probably not something you wanna do. Okay, so growth mitigation, it, it sounds simple, um, but we're not there. Politics are getting in the way. In 2010, this is good. It got on the UN radar screen. They published, you can just look up this document and get it down. Got a number of guidelines. Um, they're very simple, but look at guideline four, avoid intentional destruction and other harmful activities. I just showed you three countries that did that, right? So we can't even do the simple ones. So it doesn't give me a lot of hope. Um, I hate to be pessimistic. I always say I'm not pessimistic, I'm a, I'm a realist. There was a plan in, Jan in a few, uh, last year, I can't see that, uh, 2021, yes, um, to limit the generation by design. So do this right at the design stage. Uh, this was done uh, directly on uh, uh, Trump's desk, by the way. Um, so the idea is to track and characterize exactly the stuff we're trying to do. Uh, so it's good that governments are finally realizing that this is a problem, uh, but unfortunately, nobody's really playing um, balls they should be playing. Uh, so controlled reentry, if that's possible. Uh, what we do with um, all of our active satellites and our, our friendly nations that we work with is that any satellite that has thrusting capabilities, meaning to uh, change its orbit, at the end of its life, we require it to do a controlled maneuver over the Pacific Ocean, specific area of the Pacific Ocean, because there's no humans around. And um, that's how you deorbit it. Um, Another thought is, well, if you don't, if you don't have this, what, what can you do? Um, well, I talked about that, the lower, well, obviously the lower you go, the more drag you're gonna have. So if you have this tether with this object and it's gonna get more drag on this object down here, it can cause um, it to um, come down faster. I love the name, Terminator Tether, uh, three miles or longer. So why can't we do this? Well, NASA actually tried a tether experiment that was less than a mile, they didn't even get out to mile before it on the space shuttle and it broke the crane. Well, those people, I know people have spent their entire career engineering professors that have researched the dynamics of tethered, uh, extremely complicated stuff. And that sent a message up that whatever model we've done in their entire careers is still not good enough. Here's one that we can do though. Um, so again, it, we got that drag effect, right? So if you have a Mack truck versus a Corvette, the Mack truck's gonna have more drag because it has more surface area. So why not increase the surface area? So that satellite I showed that we're building is about a shoebox size, it's not gonna have thruster. But yeah, if you could blow up a balloon or a sail, increase the area, that's gonna bring the object down. The requirement now is that we have to bring, objects that don't have thrusting capabilities, we have to show through simulations that we can bring them down within 25 years. I think that's too long. I think we can get that down to actually less than five years, just by requiring every satellite to have this capability of either a balloon or a um, sail. Okay, um, I talked a little bit about this graveyard orbit um, a few hundred kilometers away. Um, and there's some problems there. We, we did a, the most detailed simulation in looking 50 years ahead. Again, everything that was used to pick this graveyard orbit was done using a cannonball model. We put a, a real type satellite, actually modeled the effect of the gravity of Jupiter, because that's gonna affect it in 50 years. And our simulation showed that this is not good enough, that some of these objects could be coming back into the geo and potentially colliding with uh, active satellites. So we're trying to send a message that this orbit's got to go farther away. Again, that costs money because you need to get bigger thrusters and capabilities like that. Okay, so a lot of things I see about capturing debris and things like that are all neat technology. Um, here's one, Astro's Junk Removal Demonstration in 2021. Uh, two satellites that were initially held together using a magnetic system. The CubeSat was uh, released and then recaptured. This is all great. Uh, advanced common involved stage uh, design, higher left over propellant margins uh, and having 
in space reviewing capabilities as well too. They're all great, but um, go on a little bit here, but here's, here's an idea where the various stages of what they're doing here. Uh, so they did this, uh, uh, the stage right here completed where they released and did a test capture. Now they want to do it when it's tumbling. I'll talk about the problem with that and add various phases to get to what's more realistic. I'm going to talk about these problems in a second. A neat one is the laser room. Uh, it was actually started under the uh, Star Wars program from Reagan in the 80s. And the idea is to get medium powered ground lasers to nudge the debris off course. Now I'm not talking big pieces of debris, I'm talking the very small stuff. In the 2011 study showed that you could alter the velocity by about uh, one millimeter per second, but you can keep it out for a few hours a day and it'll alter its course by several hundred meters per day. And eventually it can be come down. Okay, it's great, but you gotta be able to hit that object that's going to be very tough to do. And also you're sending lasers up in space. The FAA would not like that. So that's a no-go. Uh, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I actually did an interview with William Shatner a couple of years ago. It was great. Uh, talking about space debris, uh, the doomsday machine. Yeah. Um, that's actually something that we're kind of looking at is to, and others are looking at this too, but we're doing it differently is to essentially have an oven in space where you can cook the space debris in and make that into fuel. Uh, and I'll talk about why that's a problem uh, later on. So there's also this, this other thing called the satellite servicing bulldog, inspection, refueling, uh, robotics, uh, launch a satellite and rendezvous with large debris. Uh, here's a little animation. I show this because once it captures it, I wanted to show you something that's really important. So here this object's gonna capture another one that's rotating. Okay, it captured it. Now you see the other satellite, the first satellite start to rotate too. And that's a problem because this is not rotating that much. Any of the dynamics from this satellite is going to be transferred to that. So you can cause your satellite to go unstable. And that's a problem, obviously. You don't want that to happen because you might end up with some issues. In 2014, JAXA, which is a Japanese space agency, did an experiment with a tether. Um, and it, long story short, it ended up failing because it could not extend the uh, cable long enough. So they, they also learned the hard way that we cannot model. We've not modeled tethers as well as we thought we could. Um, it's a great idea. It was gonna use electromagnetic charge to attract metal space uh, when it comes in contact with it. But unfortunately it did not work. Um, this is something I don't think it was. Uh, this is just a release of that experiment. Remove debris, this is a kind of a neat mission. Um, it was launched in, uh, released from the space station in 2018, four basic operations. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about nets to use nets to capture debris, also harpoon, and also did some navigation stuff and also deployed a sail to do that. Here's the, so it released a little piece of simulated space debris and then it released a net. You can see the net capturing it. Now, one thing you notice is that net is not tethered to that satellite. Um, and again, because any of those dynamics are going to go through that tether back to your satellite and you might cause your satellite to go unstable. I have a professor that sits two doors down from me and Dr. Eleanor Boda, uh, her entire dissertation was starting to look at modeling those dynamics and she could spend her entire career looking at that. So we're not ready for this one either. And the next one is the harpoon. I'm not a fan of this one. It worked, but I don't know why people would on a harpoon a space object because if you don't go through it, it's going to shoot it off into another orbit. It's the last thing we want to do. So it worked. You can see how much things flop around in space, by the way. Uh, but it's not something I would do. Okay, so I want to spend uh, remaining time talking about uh, why it's tough to remove debris right now. So I live in Buffalo. And oh, by the way, I only got three inches of snow. I live in a kind region between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, uh, 20 miles south of me where the stadium is. They got uh, four feet of snow. But I live in Buffalo, I can get uh, into my car, drive to DC on one tank of gas, and then I can pick up some more gas there and go down to maybe the Carolinas and get more gas and go down to Florida if I wanted to. You can't do this easily in space. And the classic saying, which I've shown a little bit, I'll show you this in a little bit, but you can't get around in space like that. It's not that easy to do. Uh, so let's say I, I, I grab a piece of space debris and the other issue is what do you do when you grab it? push it back to earth, you know, the oven idea, okay, maybe that will work. Um, but if you push it away from the earth, then your object's gonna move away too, right? Uh, conservation of momentum, things like that. Um, so 
you get to a point A, take whatever you do. Let's say you get rid of that piece of space debris. Now you want to get to point B. So let's say you just want to do a 10 degree change to get to point B to reach another piece of debris or a satellite. And they're both at the same altitude. That requires about 40% of your fuel. Fuel. Yikes, that's a problem. <laughs> it's a lot of fuel just to go from point A to point B. Just to give you an example, going from low Earth orbit to that geo orbit, so about 220 miles to order magnitude bigger, 22,000 miles, that requires about 80% of fuel, but you did a lot. <laughs> you increased your altitude a lot. So that's great. Um, but the problem is, okay, so I go, even if I can do something with that piece of space area, which I can't right now, I go and um, want to go to another area, that's going to cost me a lot of fuel. Okay, I can maybe do that, but that's about it. So you're going to see, you see a lot of stuff in the news about this, and it's all great. I, I like it because it showcases the problem, and it's something we need to showcase. But is it a feasible solution? No, because you're just not, it's not worth building a multi-billion dollar satellite to only grab a few pieces of space degree. So classic saying is, so fortunately, the technology and money doesn't exist. But the classic saying is that you're fighting Kepler and Newton, and you will lose every time. So we have to overcome this. Um, so like I said, a lot of great experiments, no shortage of ideas, um, nothing feasible right now. And what we're doing is ma mainly focusing on what we can do well right now. And that is to be able to better track these objects. And that's why I'm working to characterize objects and understand what they look like and get better models. That's like something we can do today. So um, main points here. Yeah, space debris, not really floating objects. They're going at 17,500 miles per hour and just never hitting the ground. Very, very fast velocities. Impacts have occurred. occurred. There's some that we don't, a lot of them we don't even know about. So. Uh, that's Kessler's syndrome coming true, that objects are colliding that we don't even can see because they're less than, than 10 centimeters. It's estimated there is anywhere between um, 100,000 to 900,000 objects between one centimeter and 10, 10 centimeters. That's the stuff that keeps me up at night because astronauts are very vulnerable. Uh, a lot of people ask me, and I haven't looked at the Q&A, uh, what is it going to take? And I, I always say, well, unfortunately, it's going to take something really bad, an astronaut being hurt in space before we really take this seriously. Uh, the counter argument is that space is big um, and nothing, there hasn't been that many collisions. And I agree with that, um, but we don't wanna think like that because we're just pawning this off. Like we do a lot of things, we're just pawning this off on our children. We all know that this is gonna be a problem in 50 years if we don't do something. So we really should start doing something now. Uh, reducing collision from debris, uh, protecting humans in space is obviously the most vital thing. Uh, as I said, there's many ideas, and unfortunately, no silver bullet solution yet. A lot of research still needs to be done. For example, I talked about getting more data causes uh, data association problems. What's something that we absolutely can say right now, and we're still doing this since the 1960s, the way we track satellites has stayed the same. We haven't changed the way that we've done that. Obviously, that's, that, that is not good. We need to get that done. Um, it just hasn't been enough funding to be able to do this. And I get it, there's other problems that we need to solve first, um, but we got to start thinking about this because we need to start tracking these objects better and basically buy us time so future generations can get that technology to get to the point we can actually start taking space debris out because we can't do it now. So that's the main message I always say, buy us time, do some of those guidelines that are, follow some of those guidelines that are given by the UN and do better tracking and don't create more space debris and get us time so we can get that technology to catch up. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for having me today. Hello, okay, this Hello. is Eileen. Okay, this is Eileen. Thank you very much for the discussion. One of the questions is, does space debris affect the atmosphere by Gwen? That's an interesting question. That's more of a science question. From what I understand, there are been studies on, on how things affect the atmosphere. Um, no, not much as of right now, but as more, more stuff comes down, uh, there's still a lot. Of, the, the biggest issue with understanding that is we don't know the upper atmosphere very well in terms of models, right, as I mentioned before. But no, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, the Earth's huge, right? So having even the space station is going to come down eventually too. Um, that's not going to cause any really big issues that we're worried about. 
yeah, so it's, but I'm, I, I'm not really the definitive person to ask that question, to be honest with you. But thank you okay. for the question. All right, another question is, can debris be ejected outside Earth gravity? Can debris be ejected outside of Earth, take it past the low Earth, um, for an or like take an orbit and send it out to the moon and Mars, for example, I think it's the question. Um, no, because you'd have to get, if it's just debris that came off with an object, you'd have to affix a uh, thruster on it and have that thrust take it to that velocity of 25,000 miles per hour. So uh, that's something that's not easy to do. Um, the bad thing about the moon, which I didn't even get to, uh, there's some nice strategic points for both science and defense purposes called Lagrange points. Uh, James Webb is at one of them. I worked on the initial design of James Webb, by the way, um, back in the mid nineties. The, um, <laughs> there's space junk in, in the moon right now. That's obviously not a lot, but I keep saying in, in 50 years, if we keep doing what we're doing here, we're gonna bring our problems to the moon and make all those problems we have right now that we're thinking about now, um, out in the moon. Um, and unfortunately, China's doing some some things out there in the moon too. So um, yeah, so you don't want to do that either. You don't want to put it out in the moon <laughs> or, or even Mars because someday we want to colonize Mars, right? Uh, so there's, the only thing a really best way to do it is to somehow remove it and get it back down or um, cook it, I guess, <laughs> in a stove. Okay, another question is, are there alternative fuels Yes, uh, there's many types of fuels, some interesting uh, green fuels, by the way, that are coming up. That, um, but um, hydrazine is by far the most popular fuel because it's, it's got a, uh, there's a thing called ISP. You can think of it as how efficient that fuel is. Think of it in terms of your car, how many miles per gallon you get. Uh, hydrazine gets very, very big amount of, um, of that miles per, per gallon. Um, but it's also very dangerous stuff. A drop of that stuff will kill you. Um, I was in Bell, Bell Oil Space that used to be here that built the Bell X1 uh, about 20 miles from my house. Um, we had a rocket test facility and I, I went, finally got to see it. And we got in the chamber and I was standing next to a tank of hydrazine and I think I walked away from that. Um, so that's, that's uh, there's alternative fuels. Uh, one thing I will tell you, uh, nuclear will work, but the second you mentioned nuclear, people flip out. You don't need to flip out about that. It's, it's not anywhere near as bad as people think. There's also stuff called electronic propulsion, uh, which 20 years ago was at the research stage, but we, we have right now. It's great technology. Uh, it's very complicated stuff, but you can have that stuff on all the time. And it's essentially unlimited amount of fuel. The bad news is it's very low thrust, like million newtons of thrust. Um, but if you, and there are satellites, when you, when you put objects in the geo, they each get a slot. And because of that acceleration pressure, they're gonna drift off that slot and you kind of bring them back in. That's called station keeping. If you get these small little thrusters, these ion thrusters are on all the time. So you kind of keep them in your slot all the time. So there's technology is starting to become very popular. So yeah, if you stick that on a satellite and keep that on all the time, you can, you can obviously deorbit that, um, but we're not there yet. That technology is just starting to become popular on satellites, but there are alternative fuels. And each one of them has, is with everything I mentioned, there's good and bad news associated with, with them too. Great question. Okay, let's take a question from uh, Del Norte Hall. Okay, good afternoon, John. Uh, welcome from the audience here in Del Norte and we do have a question for you. Great. Sorry if I missed this earlier. Is the responsibility for the actual tracking with the new Space Force or is it still with the Air Force? So for me, <laughs> Right now, the Air Force and Space Force are one entity for me. Uh, so what happens is now, but with the Space Force, they, they didn't get new recruits quite yet. They're getting there, but uh, they've given people the opportunity who are at the Air Force to join the Space Force. So the answer is basically it's, it's combined. So if you look at, I work with a lot with the Air Force Research Labs, um, the Space Vehicles Director in Albuquerque, then a sabbatical there. Um, you'll see, I, I'll get emails that say Air Force, uh, and other ones that say Space Force. And a lot of them are doing the same thing. It just, some just says, decided to stay with the Air Force. So it's gonna take a little bit of time before we really get an Air Force. Now, to my surprise, when I was doing interviews before the Air Force, Space Force got started, I was worried about bureaucracy. Uh, I gotta think 
during World War II, we did not have the Air Force. That didn't come until after World War II or the Army Air Corps. Uh, so I thought the bureaucracy and starting a whole new agency of today's is nowhere near uh, as efficient it was in the 40s. Um, and to my surprise, I was wrong. I'm glad when I'm wrong. Uh, been extremely efficient, been actually under budget. Uh, so it's, and we need it. And unfortunately, I can't talk about why we need it, but we definitely need it. One thing I can say about that is there is an attack on our satellites every day. A hostile attack. Uh, it's not anything that is, it's a reversible attack, meaning that it's more annoyance type stuff that obviously if you take a missile and blow up one of our satellites, that's an act of war. Uh, these countries don't do that. Uh, but there is an attack on our satellites every day. So we have to worry about that. Okay, someone asked, for those people who can afford to go into space, will they be putting themselves at risk? Uh, sure, uh, but I wouldn't worry too much about it at that point. I'm one of them. I am going to use my some of my retirement money to go. <laughs> my wife's already giving me the green light. Um, Actually, William Shatner, before he went up, he, my interview, he said, uh, if you want to go to space, I said, I'm going. He said, I'll go with you. And, um, when they sent him up, uh, he never called me to go with him. But <laughs> uh, no, I'm not worried about it. Um, but the, the, the threat is real. It's, uh, because you're going to be inside, uh, I, I wouldn't worry about it. The, the astronauts that are out there that are exposed, those are the ones I'm worried about because a paint flake can really you can go right through their suit. So that's, that's the ones I'm really worried about. But you know they're they want to do their mission. I want it like everybody else wanted to be an astronaut. I'd gladly go out floating in space too. Um, and that's that's part of the problem. We, as I said, we haven't had anything major happen right now. And um, and they're right. I can't argue with that. That that um, space is still safe. We haven't had that many collisions. Um, so it's kind of hard to make the argument to say you know you need to worry about this 50 years from now when there's really nothing bad going on right now. But every prediction is going to show that we're going to be in a bad situation 50 years from now. Okay. Are other countries also concerned about space junk? Yeah. So the Europeans actually, Europeans actually are spending a lot more research dollars than we are. There's an office at NASA Johnson. Uh, I met the person who runs the space uh, debris mitigation office. Um, you know, NASA's budget is about what, 0.7, 0 0.8% of the federal budget. I always say, and I've worked, our center has worked for, with every agency, you name it, we've worked with them, uh, by far the most efficient agency. And I'm not saying this because I worked at NASA, I'm not saying this because I know the last administrators really well, uh, Dr. Mike Griffin, Dr. Chris Calise, um, and uh, Major General Bolden, but um, I say this because they, they just don't have the money to really waste. And unfortunately, the bad news is they don't have as much money to put their space debris uh, mitigation techniques. So Europeans are actually doing a better job than us. Um, somebody went, I did an interview one time and they asked me, what would my counterpart in China say? I said, I said well, my counterpart in China, he or she would say the exact same thing, that this is a problem, but we're at the bottom of everything, right? I do do some things in, in terms of political advocacy, but um, I'm, I got my research to do. So um, I always tell the, the younger generation, don't think of this as just an engineering problem. Get involved, get into politics, get in these years of, the, of your politicians to say, hey, you're causing a problem that I'm going to have to solve. So it's just, it's more than just an engineering aspects that need to be looked at to solve this overall problem. Okay, another question is, are there any promising systems on the drawing board to collect space debris? Um, yeah, there, well, there's no shortage of ideas I mentioned, um, but uh, unfortunately, you know, even in, I think the most promising one is probably the oven idea, um, but it takes a long time to go from concept to reality. Uh, we're talking decades. We're not talking, I got this idea in a year, I'm going to launch something. That just doesn't happen. We have to spend a lot of time to make sure we get it right and make sure it's efficient and it works. Um, so even, even the most promising idea it's at least 10 to 20 years away before we actually even may do an experiment. That's great. And think of this as the DART mission that I love that mission. I know the engineers that designed that, that hit that asteroid and moved it a little bit. Um, you know, that, that took several years of planning. Um, and that was just a demonstration, right? I only moved it a little bit uh, to do something that an asteroid's coming at us and do a real missile large enough to deflect it. That's going to take a lot more technology. So bridging that gap, even if you do an experiment, is a big gap to do. 
Uh, that's just unfortunately the reality of doing engineering, especially in space. You got to get it right and pretty much only get one shot. So <laughs> um, a lot of people tell me about being an engineer. And um, I keep saying my, my world is pretty black and white. Either the satellite works or it doesn't. So <laughs> Uh, that's just the unfortunate reality. We have to build these satellites that I like to say, imagine driving your car a million miles and never servicing that thing. And that car is on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and it has to work perfectly all the time. Well, that's what we do with satellites. And also has to work in a nasty environment. From here in the cold of Buffalo, get a much colder in space. It goes from cold to extreme heat um, within that 90 minute orbit. So that's the, and also you got radiation to deal with. So a lot of problems that we don't even have to worry about here. So your car is an easy problem compared to what we do in space. It takes time. So even the most promising solution is going to take us decades. Would it help if folks like Elon Musk, who are going into space, instead direct these funds towards managing space debris, et cetera? Absolutely would help. Um, so the I'm not a politician, uh, but I think one thing that should be done is uh, have a little tax on every satellite that's launched and use that as a global fund. And this, of course, requires international cooperation, which we probably not going to have I'm really dreaming here, but I like to dream. <laughs> um, and have an international uh, fund for scientists and engineers to get together and um, really try to get our brains together and try to come up with some technically feasible solutions. So, yes. Um, Elon Musk could do that if he wanted to. Um, he is doing some things. I, I will say he, he did. It's not essentially painting the satellites black, but if you want to think about that's way that way to reduce that um, glare for that um, light pollution, he reduced it about thirty percent, so it's still reflecting. And the Starlink constellation actually has some in-orbit capabilities to kind of move themselves. So doing some autonomous stuff in orbit, uh, which is not easy to do, um, that, that we're not there yet. Everything that, everything that we do in space is directed from the ground, the ground command from the space, and, and Musk is starting to do some space stuff. We, our university, I, I led a team that won the Space University Research Initiative, um, and this is a de Department of Defense stuff, but the idea is, um, what we're hoping to do is, we always like to say, by the time you see something in space, means uh, I can give you an idea the Russian satellite next to us and other satellites. By the time, by the time you see that, it's too late. Um, so we gotta we gotta get smarts on these satellites, and we're gonna hopefully get uh, getting towards that to be able to have these satellites be smart enough to do their own decision making. So uh, they are gonna so for example, they will have their own catalog. That catalog is going to give all the information of when a possible collision, and they're going to do their own calculations on board and do their own um, maneuvers away instead of us doing underground calculating all that stuff. Um, so hopefully we get there. That's a that's another thing of technology that we can get to right now to avoid collision. But unfortunately, that's not solving the bigger problem of removing debris and stopping the growth of debris. Okay, I don't know. Are there any more questions from uh, Del Norte? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Did you say yes? I don't know. I don't think she can hear you. Is that okay? I think I think she said yes. Yeah, but uh, we're not we're not picking up that microphone. Hold on one second. Let me switch. I think it just died. <laughs> it got you. We were waiting. Sorry, excuse us. The switch died. No problem. Okay, the question is, is there an international space agency to discuss a treaty to limit debris? And if not, would no. we to bring up with the United Nations? Right. Uh, that's one thing I did. I forgot to mention. Sorry. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, there are no international treaties. There are no international um, space agencies like that. Um, and like I said, the good news is it did get on UN's radar screen, but those are just guidelines. They're not rules. Nobody has to follow them. That's that's the unfortunate thing. So yeah, this has to be political. It has to be political will. I think these countries that are blowing up their own satellites, um, they're causing harm to their own other satellites and their people that are going into space too. I mean, it, when you think about it, it's just crazy, right? 
All right. I, I have one last question on my listing here. Are airplanes in orbit? No, uh, <laughs> technically not, but the, the space day, space shuttle is considered <laughs> sometimes an airplane. Uh, I think the way they say it, when it came back down, it was considered an airplane. But uh, no, you, you can't, you need to get that velocity of 17,500 miles per hour, right? So that's why you can't just get an airplane and go into space because an airplane can't reach that velocity. That's why we need those big rockets. So that's, uh, so a lot of talk now has been on hypersonics because our, our enemies are doing hypersonic tests and um, to build a hypersonic vehicle to reach that velocity. Um, big problems. You've got a lot of heat to, that you're going to be building up. Um, actually, here at, in Buffalo, we have the premier hypersonics tunnel of the world. Um, it was built during the old Cornell Aeronautical Labs. It's a huge tunnel. It's right across the street from the airport. Uh, so they do a whole bunch of hypersonic testing on how those materials will uh, burn up or hopefully survive in extreme heat environments at those huge velocities. So we're trying to get that technology to be able to launch something um, as an airplane and act like an airplane and come back down as an airplane. But the big key there is we got to get that at Mach, Mach 23, which is very fast. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, back to you, Jeff. Are you closing us out? I am here to thank you for this fascinating and sobering presentation. The Renaissance Society is making you an honorary member. We will also make a monetary donation to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for coming on. Uh, this Here's a reminder. All forum presentations are recorded and archived to see any of them, go to the Renaissance Society website homepage and click on recordings or go to youtube.com and search the Renaissance Society Forums Committee. Next week, we're not having uh, the forum uh, because of Thanksgiving, but the following week, we are having State Senator Ben Allen talking to us, who is just reelected. Uh, uh, about environmental legislation. He's one of the champions of environmental legislation in the California legislature. So I'm really looking forward to hearing him talk. Thank you so much for coming.